Okay, so in this last section, we're going to take a look at some buildings from various periods and various locations in Europe. Um, and what I'm going to ask is for you guys to try to identify the pieces that we just went through in those buildings. And so here we go. The first one uh, we already talked about is this Carolingian period, which is around 800 during the time of Charlemagne. Okay, and the very first thing we're going to look at, we're going to start really, really small, and actually, in my opinion, really, really ugly, um, is called the Lorsch Gatehouse. Okay, and so there, there's, there's a written record about this Lorsch Gatehouse, all right, and the architect is literally referencing the arch or a triumphal arch. Now, this picture of the gatehouse is, is a little deceiving because if you, in the next slide, you'll see what the picture of the gatehouse really looks like. What it, this picture is taken from up close and somebody has adjusted, right, the, the lines so that they're vertical. Um, so when you look at it there, you see this subdivision of three, you see the, the use of columns, you see the use of arches. It doesn't exactly look like a... Um, uh, a triumphal arch, but it has a relationship, okay? Uh, one of the things that's, that's kind of different uh, is the fact that in a Roman triumphal arch, there was a sophistication of the sculpture and the inlays and the pieces that would make up the panels in between the very sort of ornate capitals and all of the entablature that sits above it. When you look at the Lorsch Gatehouse, a lot of that ability is lost, okay? And so the architects are, are sort of coming up with this hybridization, okay? And one of the things that, that, that the architects are being tasked with during this time period by Charlemagne is to blend what they see in Byzantine architecture, because remember, Byzantine architecture, the Byzantine Empire, is in full force, all right? They've actually expanded from where they were um, when the empire split up at times. So they're being tasked with taking the work of the Byzantine architects and the work of classical Rome, particularly during the time period uh, of the Colosseum. Okay, and they're being asked to kind of bring it together. And so when we look at that, which the Colosseum is sitting right back here, okay, take a look at the repetition of the arches and the scale of the arches and compare them to what you see in the Colosseum. So, so there is this kind of blending of the two things. One of the things about Byzantine architecture also is that it relied heavily on pattern. And so while all of the inlay in the triumphal arch is extremely intricate and ornate. When we look at the Lorsch Gatehouse, you see that it's more of a patterned sort of mosaic um, sort of character. And that's, that's where we're seeing this blending of the East with the classical West. So in this next slide, you'll see what the Lorsch Gatehouse really looks like. So like I said, the, the person that took that earlier image took it from up close, which would give you a lot of sort of uh, barrel distortion, okay? So they basically have adjusted the barrel distortion to where you couldn't see the roof. So they were, they were at the angle of this roof somewhere in the front here to where you could almost not see it. But even though it's got this little bell tower at the top and it does have elements that are very much Roman, okay, or, or of Romanesque character. Um, understand that this sits uh, in northern Europe, or, or not in northern Europe, but in, it sits north in Europe, in Germany. So it does get cold, it does snow there, and so you have these steeper pitched roofs that you might not need to have in sections that are closer to the Mediterranean, right, further to the south. Um, so understand a couple things. First of all, there are two apsidal forms on the ends. When you look at the columns, they are using a Corinthian column. 
okay? And the proportions of the column are relatively close to a, a Corinthian column. There is no entasis. The column just goes straight up and down. They've, they've lost that ability. When we look at the, the detailing of the upper portion where we see this mosaic, here we see an ionic capital that's been sort of placed over top of a pilaster, a pilaster. So that's kind of a, a way of creating that column that we talked about. Now, what would this column be called? <laughs> we talked about it. It was the very first slide in the characteristics. An engaged column. She took notes. Good girl. <laughs> yes, it's an engaged column. It's halfway embedded in the wall. Okay. So understand those are sorts of those are those are easy questions for me to develop. Okay. And so when I show you a picture, I'm not going to show you the picture that was in the little slide that says this is an engaged column. It's going to be something like this, where you have to say. So what kind of column is that, other than Corinthian? OK, so another building from this same time period is called the Palatine Chapel. And I, I hope I'm not butchering that name too badly. The Palatine Chapel was built in, in, um, in Charlemagne's palace. It later becomes a church, but it's initially built as a small chapel. And again, we see this sort of charge that, that Charlemagne or Charlemagne, as somebody else would pronounce it, has given to their architect. And that is to blend what they're seeing in the Byzantine Eastern Roman Empire with the architecture of Rome. And so this is the interior of the Palatine Chapel. Okay, And what we're, we'll see is when we start to compare it to a building from 522 AD that is definitely in the Eastern uh, sort of influence of the, uh, the Eastern Empire, right? This is San Vitala in Ravenna. Okay, I believe Ravenna is somewhere up by Venice. And this is the plan of the Palantine Chapel, all right? So both of them have these sort of double shells. So there's an outer shell and then an inner shell, okay? And so in this particular case, the inner shell is round with an octagonal outer shell. In the case of the Palatine Chapel, the outer shell is more round with an octagonal sort of center, okay? Um, they both rely on a centralized organization, as we saw in many of the Byzantine churches, all right? Um, in the case of uh, San Vitala of Ravenea, we have the narthex that's kind of attached at a strange angle. It's off axes from the nave and the apse. Uh, in the case of the Palatine Chapel, it is directly um, on axes. Okay? So both of them use eight columns to organize that central space and support the upper portion. If, you, if we go back to... The previous view, this was the interior that you were looking at in the Palantine Chapel. All right, you can see that there are arches below. So the in the plan, what you're looking at is these sort of um, piers down in here, and then the arches are up above it. This is forming the octagon. That's all up above. So coming back to this, right, that is showing these things right here. So that view was taken from here looking up at these three arches. Okay? All right. So there is there's so there's a strong sort of relationship between the two, right? From a planning perspective and from a proportional perspective. Um, when we look at the section, we see a, a similar sort of relationship. So two sections of the Palatine Chapel one cross section, one through the long, the long direction. Same thing on this side, there's the, the San Vitali through the short section and through the long section. And we see that there is that centralized form with the radiating pieces around it. That was an intentional thing. But one thing that's sort of different is that there is a complexity to the way that the spaces are layered in San Vitali, right, that are not visible in the Palatine Chapel. 
So when you look at the Palatine Chapel, it, the spaces seem like they're sort of just a space that's to the side of that central core. Whereas when you look at San Vitale, the spaces blend in. They become part of that. It's almost like they exploded out from that central space. And you can see that um, when we take a look at the interior comparison of the two. So the, the, the image on the left is the Palatine Chapel. And you can see that, that it's intended to be one space, right, vertically. Whereas when you look at San Vitale, it's like these apsidal forms that are to the side, right, are intended to be part of that central form or that central space, okay? So taking a look at, you know, some of the, the, the significance of the Palatine Chapel and things like the, 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 um, the, the gatehouse is that there's this synthesis, there's this combining of ideas, right, between classical Rome, well, what they knew of classical Rome, what they could imitate of classical Rome, and the Eastern Roman Empire, okay? So that becomes kind of a new direction because you're basically hybridizing two things. The East learned from the West and then went their own direction. These guys are taking that other direction and they're blending it back with what they understand. Um, the second thing that you'll notice about Romanesque architecture is that it is very sort of clearly defined. Remember I mentioned that it looked that if you look at the forms, there are all these cylinders and drums and and like pyramidal forms or or extruded rectangles or extruded um, uh, um, sort of squares right so there's this really strong rational attachment to the platonic forms that are mathematically derived um, and there is a there's a modularity a repetition of things that's being brought in at the same time that there is a fragmentation occurring. Because when you look at, at, at some of those cathedrals and you see an apsidal form with two ambulatories and ten radiating chapels, that's kind of a fragmentation of space. It's like space layered upon space layered upon space and it sort of breaks up into pieces. And then when you look at the outside of some of the buildings, you'll notice that they have a very, there is symmetry embedded in an asymmetrical composition. Sometimes one tower doesn't match the other tower, for example. All right, period. No. <laughs> okay, so taking a look at the evolution of the Romanesque. So Charlemagne died in 1814, and about the time of his death, his empire, that, that swath of Western Europe that he managed to bring back together, it gets divided amongst his sons. Okay? That was something that, that Constantine stopped doing in the Eastern Empire. He, just, he said, no, only the eldest gets it. The other ones don't. And so in this particular case, that the empire of, of Charlemagne gets divided Okay, and so it breaks up into pieces. And at the same time that that's happening, right, all of a sudden all these people, right, see the riches, and not the riches, but they see the, the sort of culture that's developing in Europe, and they come in to grab the spoils. So you've got the Arabs coming up from the south, from the Mediterranean, and, and moving into Spain. At the same time, you've got the Vikings and the Scandinavian people coming in from the north, and then from the east, you've got the Slavs and, I'm not sure how to pronounce, Magyars, right? But those are going to be the barbaric people that originally come down, um, coming across uh, from what would be like Bosnia and uh, Croatia and those areas. Um, so, um, oops, what happened? There it goes. Oh, shoot, I'm too far, so stop. 